And so some of you know, I've been working for, for many years now, um, I think possibly approaching 10 years with, with Sean Gribb, who's, who's currently in, in Groningen, on a project relating to time in, in quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. Uh, and over the years, we've given many kind of slightly different motivations for how to kind of, where are the kind of um, conceptual or formal um, kind of jumping off point or jumping in point for our project is what, why we think we should treat time slightly differently to conventional approaches. Um, and a lot of these have really been quite technical and quite fiddly to do with interpretation of constraints and um, issues to do with variational principles and, quantiz and quantization. More recently, um, Sean in particular um, came across a very interesting connection between one of the motivational principles that we have relating to how we should think about um, constants of nature in particular, whether we should think of the uh, energy of the universe as a constant of nature or a constant of motion. Uh, Sean found this very interesting connection to, to the work of Henri Poincaré. And so what I wanted to do was kind of talk you through um, how we can motivate the project in a different way um, which I think is quite interesting and has wider implications for other areas of philosophy and other questions uh, in the interpretation of physical theory. But I, I realize that we've, we've got to a point now where, where we've been sitting on, on, in front of our computers watching Zoom talks for, for the best part of a year. So I thought I'd perhaps try and make it a little bit more fun. Um, and so the question is, oh, we have Henri Poincaré, uh, who you all know, kind of arguably the last great polymath, monumental contributions to, to applied mathematics, pure mathematics, um, particularly in relation to, to the like um, um, initial value problem, um, also areas of pure mathematics, of course, a very important philosopher of science, um, really, really, and physicist, it's kind of monumental historical figure who, who we all know has said a lot about relationalism. Um, dark energy, which, well, we, we, we kind of know a bit about dark energy. It appears in the Einstein field equation as a constant term. We don't know that much more about that. It seemed to be the an extra kind of factor or force or thing that is in the universe that has overwhelming um, importance of up to 70% of the the energy is related to dark energy, but we don't really understand what it is. Um, to a large extent, there are some quite hy hypothetical models, but not, not no um, unified or complete understanding by any stretch of the imagination. And robots, killer robots. So what, what do these things possibly have together, uh, have to do with each other? Um, and so that's what I want to try and, um, the story I want to try and weave together, which, which starts with the robots and then goes on to Poincaré and then ends with, with dark energy or the cosmological constant. Um, so let's start with this, this, the story of cricket, which is where the robots come in. So let's just imagine um, a planet that's entirely secluded by a cloud. And there are intelligent inhabitants of this planet who um, look around and they see nothing, they see no stars, perhaps we probably have to hypothesize a, a single star system within, within the cloud for it to make any physical sense, but let's ignore that for the time being. But no other planets, no distant stars, no other structure to the universe at all. Um, we can imagine these, these hypothetical kind of inhabitants of this planet, let's call it cricket, um, as conceiving of the world of the universe as being entirely consisted by themselves and the planet. They have no information coming in, let's assume, um, and all they can do is make local observations or, or, on, on their, their planet. Um, for instance, they might observe that it's not a perfect sphere, it's a blake, um, and they might make inferences based upon that. Um, but otherwise, they have no, no information about anything outside them. Um, let's imagine that one day uh, a rocket from outside the universe lands on the planet. And like these are fairly kind of 
um, technologically non-sophisticated people at this stage. They're, they're simple farmers who live off the planet and live, in fact, a very blissful life in the ignorance of the existence of the rest of the universe. Because if you felt that special, wouldn't you be happy? Um, and the rocket arrives and they see that there is this other universe outside, there is other technology outside of their planet. And they're really, frankly, quite unhappy about this. Uh, and they decide that given that the existence of the rest of the universe is really intolerable from their kind of perspective of their civilization, their culture, um, it really has to go. And so what they do in response is that they um, construct uh, a um, large number of killer cricket robots, which are literally robots from cricket that play cricket and use cricket bats as, as a means of um, destruction and the inhabitants of cricket construct these robots and send them out to, to destroy the rest of the universe um, which seems quite reasonable in the circumstances um, and so if you want to learn more about cricket and, and, and whether or not the ro robots do in fact succeed in destroying the, the the rest of the universe I, I refer you to Adams 1982 um, but for, for the time being what we could think about as a different question is well to what extent is it really plausible to think that the inhabitants of cricket wouldn't be, have been able to infer the existence of the rest of the universe before the arrival of the spaceship? What kind of local evidence did, would they have had that they were only a subsystem of the universe rather than the universe, rather than the totality of the universe? Um, and it, interestingly, this kind of question was perhaps not in exactly these terms, but in very similar terms posed by Poincaré already in in uh, science and hypothesis uh, in the early 19th century, early 20th century. And there's actually, in, in case you haven't seen a, a wonderful new translation of science hypothesis, which, I, which I, I really do strongly recommend, that only came out a few years ago, which I've been, which I've been kind of profited from uh, in, in giving this talk. Um, so one thing you could think about, and which Poincaré himself um, suggests is that, well, look, if we imagine cricket rather than thinking about this slightly unrealistic situation where you have a single planet and a star or a single planet with no star. We think about a solar system. So, so we could think about the cloud as something like enveloping our solar system, right? Like around the Oort cloud or something like that. Um, there would just be this dense cloud that blocks all electromagnetic radiation. Um, and we imagine that the astronomers, they, they can make accurate measurements of the separation between the planets, the suns, any moons. They can measure the rates of changes of distances. And we also imagine they're pretty smart, these cricket, cricket astronomers. They can use Newton's law of gravitation and calculate the dynamics of the system. So we have something, something like this, right? This, this is the rough kind of setup that we're imagining. Um, and we're imagining these, these uh, as practical astronomers trying to make predictions about where the planets will be um, in the future. What, what, what Poincaré points out is that there'd still be a piece of information relevant to the calculation of the dynamics that the astronomers lacked. And this is what he calls the constants of area, or what we usually think of in terms of the, the, the variables that fix the overall angular momentum of the solar system. And the important point is that different angular momentum, values of angular momentum, um, are going to correspond to different physical like dynamics within the solar system. Um, so different values of overall angular momentum uh, for a locally bound gravitational system will have discernible effects on the system's dynamics. And this is the solar system analog of the fact that, that a rotating spheroid is, is, is a, a blade. So we could understand the cricket astronomers as, as needing to measure a particular parameter related to the overall angular momentum system and needed to add it into their equations in order to have an empirically adequate framework for their dynamics. And this is of course a very familiar topic which has been discussed at least since, since Newton's famous uh, buckets and globes demonstrations and which feeds into a very fascinating rich and um, to some extent, not yet fully settled debate regarding how we should interpret the implications of overall rotation for relational theories. Um, and so if you actually, if you're interested, there's, a, there's a, a fascinating paper recently 
from, from Sean Gribb and, and Enrique Gomez, where they argue that you can have um, relational theories of non-zero angular momentum contra the, the mainstream view. Um, this isn't going to be my topic. I'm just highlighting that because I think it's an interesting connection. And it wasn't really Poincaré's topic in this particular passage that I'm uh, focusing on. Uh, rather, what, what Poincaré says, and just after he makes essentially the argument I've just given, um, is he, he has this short passage, which to my knowledge has only been discussed in detail once in the subsequent literature, which is by Schlick, and I'll get to that discussion later, where he says, well, look, couldn't we make, could, or are there not implications for the interpretation of that constant that we add in? Um, in particular, consider the following distinction. We can think, of, this is from Poincaré, think about two different sorts of constants. From the viewpoint of the physicists, uh, the, the world is reducible to succession of phenomena that depend solely on the one hand, the initial phenomena, on the other hand, the laws connecting constituents to ant uh, antecedents. Uh, therefore, when observation shows us that a certain quantity is constant, there are two perspectives open on, on how we should understand that constant. On the one hand, we could assume that there is a law that says that this quantity cannot vary, and it is by, cha by chance that at the very beginning of time, it happened to take one value rather than another, a value that it's retained ever since. That quantity could then be called an accidental con constant. On the other hand, we could assume that there is a law of nature imposing on this quantity one value rather than another. We could then have what would be called an essential constant. And so this is essentially the same distinction that people typically term uh, the difference between constants of motion and constants of nature, with constants of motion being the accidental constants and constants of nature being the essential constants. And I'll return to this connection shortly. I do not know whether giving chance its role in such a way is itself legitimate or whether this distinction that I'm drawing has something artificial about it. It is certain that as, as long as nature has secrets, its implementation will be highly arbitrary and always precarious. So the, the, initial, the connection I want to draw here is between the epi, uh, kind of epistemology, the kind of situation of limited knowledge and the classification of constants. And what Poincaré is saying is that in a situation where there is limited knowledge, uh, the classification of a constant as a constant of motion rather than a constant of, uh, of nature as an accidental constant rather than as an essential constant is to some ways still up for grabs. At least that's the way I, I would read him. So, I'm not sure if I make the analogy later, but let me just explain it now. And so the idea is that if you're in the situation of the cricket inhabitants before the rocket arrives, and you add into your equations this additional parameter, this the constant, the, the, the angular momentum, um, it is perfectly reasonable for you, given your epistemic standpoint, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know that there are all these other, that you're merely a subsystem. From your perspective, you could rationally interpret the angular momentum as a constant of nature rather than a constant of motion. But then when you get the information that find out that you're a subsystem, that classification then changes based upon the, the new information you understand that you're merely a subsystem and you see the contingency of the, of your, of the angular momentum of your planet or your solar system. And so the idea drawing on Poincaré and the cricket example is that there's a, a connection between the way we classify our, our constants as constants of nature or constants of motion and our epistemic standpoint. So I, I actually, I'm not sure if I already, or will say this in the next slide, but I just wanted to, to make it clear in case I didn't. Um, and this is certainly not in any way a mainstream view in discussions of constants of nature or constants of motion. In fact, I haven't found it anywhere, apart from in Poincaré and this subsequent discussion by, by Schlick. It's usually assumed that constants of nature um, 
can be distinguished from constants of motion unambiguously in both physics and in, in philosophy of science, to my knowledge. And if anyone knows of other discussions along these lines, I'd, I'd be extremely interested to find out. Um, usually we think about the distinction is resting upon the fact that we can observe and sometimes prepare subsystems with different values of the constants of motion. But the things we call constants of nature are universal and same everywhere, same of every system and unvaried. So we don't think of the angular, of angular momentum of a, of, of, a, of a solar system as a constant of nature precisely because we could imagine preparing different different values of it in principle at least certainly we can prepare different values of the angular momentum of of, of, of much smaller subsystems um, however we don't think of things like the gravitational constant the speed of light or the cosmological constant as having that, that same kind of um, we don't think about these as things that can be prepared at different values within one universe. And so it seems like we've got a very clear distinction that we can make between constant of motion and constants of nature. Um, contra Poincare, that, that this distinction is not artificial or arbitrary. That, that's, I think, a very plausible view and certainly what, what I, I thought myself for, for many years. Um, and, and really in, in a kind of slightly more, more, more metaphysical um, Kind of way of approaching this discussion, we might think about this in terms of the modal status of the constants. Just as in, in actual fact, in our actual world, the constants of nature and constants of motion are the same in the sense that they're both constant. The important thing is, and this kind of goes to the heart of Poincare's kind of pointing out the role of, 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 of chance or luck, is that constants of motion are in some sense seem to be contingent. On a particular initial conditions, whereas there's some kind of necessity or law-like nature behind constant, the value that constant of nature takes. So it seems like we've got a kind of both a kind of more, more pragmatic physics way of making this distinction and a more metaphysical way of making this distinction, which which doesn't seem to be ambiguous. And I think so far as subsystems of the universe goes, this that's probably the right view to take. However, the level of the entire universe, it's not quite clear if these distinction, this distinction is so, so, so like unmuddied and so clean. Is there a clear difference between initial conditions of the universe and laws? Is there a, is there a clear distinction between, or how should we understand the distinction between um, constants of nature and constants of motion in the concept of the constants of motion pertaining to the entire universe. Since it obviously isn't the case that we're able to prepare universes with different values of those constants in either case. So consider the angular momentum, and this really relates to, uh, to some extent to a proposal by, um, by Pooley and Brown to interpret Barber's relational theory, but I don't want to go into too much detail of that. Couldn't we treat the angular momentum of the universe being zero as something more like a law-like prediction? It's something that's, that's law-like in, in, in relational theories. And take then the, the energy of, 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 a, of, a, of a universe, which didn't rotate, sorry, um, take the angular momentum of a universe that doesn't rotate to be in fact necessity. And we, we do think our universe, um, has a has zero angular momentum. So if you, Pooley and Brown write a little bit about this proposal in their, their relationalism uh, rehabilitated paper. Um, and and I, I don't want to go into the, the, the kind of old debate about the angular momentum of the universe. Uh, that's not really my main purpose. It's more of a kind of um, a dialectical kind of analogy, which I, I, I want to suggest. Um, what I would like to do is actually push things in a different direction. And this is what Schlick does. And, and go back to the early 20th century. And, and like I said, I, I'm extremely surprised. I, I've done a fairly comprehensive um, search, but to my knowledge, the only detailed discussion of the claim that by of Poincare that the constants of motion and constants of nature is not a uh, is some sense an arbitrary distinction 
um, people have cited that essay, it's in the main essay on relationalism in, in the collection, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, probably thousands of times. I've only found one genuine discussion of the point, and that's due to Schlick um, from only a few years after Poincaré. Um, and that kind of takes, it kind of suggests in another analogy, um, rather than getting just stuck on the question of rotation, um, Schlick suggests a kind of uh, thinking about the, um, the role of constants in the context of quantum mechanics. And I think that's probably the seeds of, the, of what I think is the right way to, 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 to kind of generalize Moncari's point. Um, so this is from, from, from a um, essay Schlick wrote, I think in, in 1924, something thereabouts. Um, it's easy to understand why Poincaré holds the division between accidental and essential constants to be a fluid one. If we recall, for example, that in earlier times, the atomic weight and other properties of the chemical elements could quite properly be regarded as contingent quantities. Whereas the modern development has taught us to view them as essential quantities that cannot be app apprehended through connections of law. Yet it seems perfectly possible to draw a boundary of principle between essential, essential and contingent determinations in the sense discussed, if only we bear in mind the actual findings of science have not in fact everywhere advanced to that boundary and are in part still far from it. And so there's two things I guess I wanted to point to. So one is this is an example of in fact, the opposite process than we're thinking about the story of cricket. So in the story of cricket, the astronomers take a constant to be a constant of, of nature. And then by learning more about bigger, bigger scales, learning that they're just a subsystem, they reclassify this as a constant of motion, right? And what Schlick is pointing to is, is a this is rather than a fantastical example, a genuine historical example, where scientists thought that atomic weights were constants were, 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 were calling them constants of motion is probably slightly misleading, but were accidental constants. But learning more about the fine structure of the atom, they realize that there's actually, um, in some important sense, uh, essential constants underlying the regularities in, in mass ratios that they, that they, that they, they, they were able to, to isolate. Um, so that's the first point that this reclassification through, through, through gaining knowledge can go both ways. And the second point is again, kind of going back to this epistemological angle that Schick says, well, look, if we did know everything, if we advanced to, 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 to some kind of final theory, then there wouldn't be an issue because we wouldn't have any ambiguities left. So what, what I want to do is, is propose a kind of slight inversion of that. Um, so I want to propose that given that we, I think it's plausible to think that we'll never be in a situation where there aren't scales or um, places or times which we don't know f uh, full information about, that we will always have to live with the possibility of our constants being reclassified. So rather immodestly, I'm going to call this the, the, something like a new Copernican principle. There's a relationship between uh, the epistemic access we have to different scales and the categorization of constants. So unless we have, assume we have access to all scales, we should not assume that our current categorizations of constants is the final one. Given that we don't have access to all scales, it is like there is, a, there is always a kind of a humility we should have about what we call a constant nature and what we call a constant emotion. And we should kind of allow for the possibility that learning more about larger or smaller scales might lead us to reclassify our constants. Just as the inhabitants of cricket might interpret, this is what I've talked about already, the angular momentum of their solar system as a constant of nature rather than a constant of motion on the basis of their lack of access to larger length scales. We can see the early 19th century chemists as interpreting atomic weight of an element as being contingent on that basis on the basis of their lack of access to very small length scales and the essential properties of the fundamental particles. So applying this reasoning, I think 
plausibly in our current state of science means we accept that we have limited epistemic access. And we can think about this in terms of orders of magnitude of spatial, temporal, spatiotemporal, also numerical scales. Uh, I think that's very important to think about there being new effects emerging on, 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 on to do with complexity, to do with numerosity, and also just kind of in some sense unifying these in terms of the energy scales. So given we only have a, a limited, and we will only have a limited epistemic window, um, we should always take our categorizations of constants to be tentative. And there's a sense in which I think this is, ties in well with, with a notion of perspecti perspectival. So it's not really necessary in saying, it's not that it's a matter of, it's just a matter of perspective man, right? It's not like the idea isn't that um, you can just choose to have a different classification by, um, I don't know, having a different, um, ethical or, or normative view or pragmatic viewpoint. I, I think that's probably not that helpful. The idea is that you could think about a categorization of constants as being um, indexed to a certain spatiotemporal or numerical scale. And this is really closer, to, although it's related to the perspectivism of people like um, Giri and Massimi, I think it's most kind of closely uh, articulated in two recent papers by uh, Anna Maria Kretsu and, and Peter Evans, who talk about perspectivism in, in, in a more specific form, that, close to what I'm talking about. Um, so it's quite, um, it's really a question about um, a the objective status of an observer and the epistemic scale that they have access to. And one particular thing that we want to allow for is that observers might have different um, non I can one observe two observers might have access to different scales where neither in, ne nearly entirely encompasses the other, and in such circumstances they might have different co classification of constants, and there is no kind of basis by which we should say that one is better than the others. I think certainly we want to say that observers who have access to, to a strictly greater set of, of scales than a, than another observer, we should trust their classification more. But we can we can imagine a situation in which one observer has um, access to bigger scales and one observer has access to smaller scales. In which case, there wouldn't be a factor of the matter according to this view about which perspective on how to classify constants um, we should trust. Okay, so that so that's a very sketchy and very general idea about how we might rethink the classification of constants. I'd be fascinated to think to hear if, if, if any of you think there's something fundamentally wrong with it. I'm quite interested to develop it more. What I want to do in this last, um, so you said it, how long do I have, Antonio? Still, I think 20 minutes, if you want. Perfect, that's absolutely perfect. Um, what I'd like to do in the last 20 minutes is just tell you how on earth this relates to dark energy and, and cosmology, uh, and in particular, a proposal for how to think about quantum gravity that me and Sean have been working on for a number of years. Um, and this is this will involve, uh, I am gonna kind of change the tenor of the talk quite quite considerably and talk about some, some areas of mathematics that are more technical, but hopefully I'll be able to do this in a kind of, in a way that everyone um, gets, gets enough out of it. Um, so it's neither too imprecise to be useful for the more technical people nor too technical to be Unuseful for the less technical people. But let's just start off with um, forget about quantum cosmology, forget about gravity to an extent. Uh, I'm a simple minded philosopher, so I like simple models. I spent a large amount of my time playing with Newtonian toy models. Um, the particular fact that's interesting about there's a particular species of, of Newtonian toy models, which we could call reparameterization invariant. Parameter invariant, um, Julian Barber often calls them Jacobi models. Uh, Carlo Rovelli calls them relational theories, which are to relativistic theories, which is a bit confusing, I find. In any case, the po important point is that there's a whole family of models which are essentially very similar to Newtonian mechanics. We just introduce an extra symmetry that allows us to re parameterize dynamical curves. So we can write down a Lagrangian theory 
for, for these particle models in which the action is invariant under us re-time labeling the, the curves. So we could think about, just think about a, your, a box of Newtonian particles flying around described by uh, Newtonian mechanics. There's a way of introducing an extra symmetry such that if you transform everything so that this, in some sense, the speed of time, so you have a background time in, in, in some sense, right? We have absolute simultaneity, but we, at the speed of time, the kind of metric of distance between the time slices, we can arbitrarily relabel. So this is a re-parameterization, re uh, time reparameterization. It's a, it's a local symmetry. It's a very subtle and confusing symmetry, to be honest. There's a lot I could say about the problem about how to classify it. But we can play with these models. And, and what we can do is, because these models have important properties in common with cosmological and gravitational models, although not all properties, particularly if, because we assume relative, absolute simultaneity, um, we can play with their properties. And one of the most interesting and perplexing properties of these models is we can show that in general, they're going to have a vanishing Hamiltonian. So for a, there's a theorem, um, which is almost trivial, that given any theory in which the action is invariant under time reparameterizations, in which essentially the laws don't care this, how this, what the speed of time is, we can rescale time, any theory of that kind necess necessarily, necessarily will have a vanishing Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian will be a constraint and the energy will be zero for that reason. Okay, so that's just, that's a simple fact. I think the interpretation of the fact is the thing that's, that's interesting. Um, in particular, the standard interpretation is to think about this as a, as a, uh, a constant of, motion, of nature that these theories, energy really does vanish necessarily. There's a gnomic necessity to, to the energy being zero. Ultimately, whether we think of that as a constant of nature or a constant of motion doesn't really matter. We can always reconstruct, it would be absurd if we couldn't reconstruct the dynamics of this theory, which is essentially just Newtonian mechanics with a bit more, um, a bit less structure in, in absolute time. It doesn't have time metrics aren't absolute. Whether we interpret the energy vanishing condition as a constant of no nature or a constant of motion, we can always reconstruct the dynamics. And there's some debate on how we should best do that. Um, Ravelli does, has a particular methodology for doing it into using uh, deparameterization internal clocks, which is slightly different to the methodology that Julian Barber proposes using a kind of ephemeris time. Uh, personally, I think there's a lot practically to be said about Barber's methodology in practice, actually using internal clocks and deparameterizing a la Ravelli is very complex, but ultimately we can get time back out of the system. It doesn't really matter how we treat constant motion versus constant of nature. Okay, so for, this, for this simple toy model. Uh, can However, you, can, you, can yeah. you take a quick question? Because yeah. I think I asked a question in the chat. He's asking, does the energy need to be zero or can it be a constant? Because that will still be a conserved constraint. So in some sense, this is the, this is the subtlety. Um, the theorem, like we can redefine what we mean by zero such that we can treat it as a constant if we treat it as a constant of, of, of motion, to be honest, that's that, that justify, if we're treating it as a constant of motion, we can introduce an extra constant corresponding to a non-zero energy. Um, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that clear? Um, okay, um, we, we can discuss further in the Q&A if something is, is not- So I, I think, to be honest, personally, I think, strictly speaking, it doesn't in fact need to be zero. Um, so and I think that's ultimately the reason why I think it's better to interpret it as a constant of motion. Um, but let, we can come back to that later. Um, all right, so the point is that in any case, if we treat E equals zero as a gnomic restriction on the quantum state, then the way that we think about quantization enforces us to take the 
wave function to be super selective to an eigen to, to the zero eigenstate. Um, I think ultimately, if if energy was constant rather than zero, um, and we were just super selecting to, which is why perhaps what I said isn't quite right. If we were taking it as a constant, but still tr a non-zero constant, but tr still treating it as a constant of nature, we'd still want to super select to an eigenstate, just a non-zero eigenstate. Um, in any case, if it's a constant of nature, we end up with this frozen formalism where, where the wave function of the universe is required to be in, in an eigenstate. And this is motivated through, through the Dirac constraint quantization algorithm. There are some interesting questions about the degree to which we should trust the algorithm for Hamiltonian constraints, given that the theorem which the connection between constraints and um, transformations that don't involve, don't change the physical state in Dirac's terminology is a little bit subtle because the theorem in fact doesn't work for Hamiltonian constraints. I could probably give a week of talks about this issue. It's very interesting and subtle, but ultimately the mainstream view on, on these toy models is that energy is a constant of nature. It's constrained to be zero. And this implies a frozen formalism with the wave function trapped in an energy eigenstate. What Sean and I want to propose is precisely in these toy models to treat energy as a constant of motion, allow for the quantum theory to have, I, um, to have superpositions of eigenstates of energy, which ultimately involves treating the zero constraint as, as an artifact, because we can just redefine what we mean by the zero and the scale. And this results in something closer to, a, to something essentially the same as a Schrodinger equation for this system, which seems to me a more, more adequate description. All we've done is introduce this extra time symmetry, um, which doesn't destroy the kind of basic scaffold of Newtonian time. It just allows us to give this um, reparameterization of, of the, the local kind of ticking rate of the clock. Um, why should that mean that the quantum theory is frozen? I think, I think there's good reason to think that um, we should expect the quantum theory to look more like a Schrodinger equation. In any case, I think it's very much up for grabs how we should interpret the energy within these simple models. And I think it's a point in favor of mine and Sean's proposal that interpreting it as a constant of motion leads to, to a kind of quite sensible and straightforward quantum theory like essentially the same as, as, as ordinary quantum mechanics. But ultimately this isn't really the context in which in which we're really interested in exploring. Um, what we really want to know is what happens when we start thinking about quantum gravity or quantum cosmology. And in that case we again have this situation in which we have this invariance under time reparameterizations and we again have this situation where we, we interpret the, the Hamiltonian as a constraint. And in fact, the, the Hamiltonian is much more complicated. There's an infinite family of them. And there's some subtleties to do with um, the fact that the time of parameterization is local rather than global. Um, that notwithstanding, we can think about simple models in which we only have one Hamiltonian constraint. These are mini superspace FLRW models and run through exactly the same argument. What's interesting now, though, is that the role that was played by energy in the simple models is now played by the cosmological constant. And on the standard view, we take the cosmological constant as a constant of nature, and that leads us to a timeless wheeler dewitt model, um, where the wave function of the universe in these simple cosmological models, just as in the, the particle models, we're stuck in an eigenstate in the cos in the simple cosmological models, we're stuck in an eigenstate, eigenstate uh, of the cosmological constant, um, and we end up with this frozen time evolution. Um, and there are pathologies in this model, which is, I think, uh, important to point out, that you can get, in particular, unbounded expectation values um, for physical quantities. Um, so you have, essentially, the quantum shadow of classical singularities showing up it, um, through the explosion of the expectation values. You can also have failure of, non of unitarity. 
Um, I, in the interest of time, I'll maybe I'll skip this and we can come back to it. I, I personally think that when we think about singularities, the best way to try and understand what it is for theory not to have a singularity is exactly in the opposite of what I just described. The fact that the, the, the expectation value of, a, of the classically singular quantity becomes finite in the quantum theory. And I think that's the best definition of singularity resolution. I think there's problems with some of the others that have been proposed, but we can come back to that if people want to talk about it. Ultimately, what, what, what the positive proposal that, that Sean and I have made in, in, in quite a few papers is that if we apply our kind of procedure in which we treat the cosmological constant as a constant of motion, like we treat the energy in the, in the toy models, um, we end up with a theory in which we have um, a quantum cosmology with different phenomenological properties from the standard quantum cosmology. It, we have superpositions of cosmological constant. Um, what this implies is that we ultimately have cosmic bounces, the wave function of the universe bounces off the singularity. Um, there's interesting connections potentially to inflationary phenomenology, but for our context, the important thing is that the, the singularity problem gets resolved in the precise sense that I talked about, that op all the operators, the expectation values are finite at all times. Um, and so, this is a little, I, I used to be able to get the videos to work in my latex slides and for some reason I can't anymore. So this is the, um, this is symmetric about the t time equals zero. So you can read this diagram through through twice. This, think about this as late time, as early time now. We're basically bounce, and this is the expectation value of the, the volume of the universe. So I think, yeah, the volume of the universe. And then this is to so the geometric degree of freedom. And this is the expectation value of, of the scale of field to so the matter degree of freedom. We're basically bouncing, and this is the amplitude of the uh, wave function, right? We're basically bouncing the wave function off the singularity as this axis here. We're basically bouncing the wave function, as it go, like that. Off the singularity, you get this weird behavior close to singularity, and it will bounce back out again. So it's a fully kind of symmetric universe. Um, where none of the expectation values explode. Um, so interestingly, we started off with this very kind of abstract philosophical question about how to interpret constant of motion and constant of nature. And I told you classically, it doesn't make much difference, but in the quantum theory, it makes a world of difference. Uh, and you end up with a different theory of different properties. In particular, the rational quantization approach that Sean and I have applied based upon this interpretation of the cons cosmological constant as constant of, of motion, leads to the resolution of the Big Bang singularity in, this, in the precise sense of having a finite expectation value for all operators, which in some ways is very similar to the way loop quantum cosmology resolves singularities. Um, albeit in the framework where cosmological constant is a constant of nature, but by introducing extra ingredients, which in a sense, unsurprisingly resolve the singularity, such as a Planck scale cutoff. So how does this all tie together, right? So what is, what justifies interpreting the cosmological constant as a constant of motion rather than constant of nature from this kind of Co Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen, Copernican principle? Um, why, sh what is it that we don't know that we're, Kind of adding in to try and relegate the constant, a little bit like the inhabitants of um, of cricket, they don't know that they're a local subsystem. They think of their angular momentum of their their solar system as a constant of nature. By learning that they're a con they're only a subsystem, by expanding their epistemic horizons, they reclassify that constant as a constant of motion. We've, in some sense, done the reclassification bit, but I haven't told you what the extra thing we learned was. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to best motivate this. It's, it's different ways of thinking about it. Could we think about um, some kind of effective field theory perspective? Um, perhaps this is telling us quantized general relativity isn't um, the final story. Possibly it's something to do with asymptotic boundary conditions. Um, there's something else that we need to add to the, to the story to, to have a really complete picture. Um, finally, like as, as I'm sure Eric will, will, will not be, hesitate to point out, another option is to go go Everettian, which would be a disaster from my perspective, and say, well, look, this is to do with the fact that 
um, we need to invoke a, multi a multiverse view to understand why we've included the cosmological constant as a as a constant of motion. Um, I'd be loathed if that was the case, but 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 uh, we'll see. Um, another idea, which I guess I'd also be loathed to, to do, which relatedly but differently, is to think about eternal inflation or some kind of um, string multiverse. Um, I think there's lots of different ways of trying to interpret why we might think of the cosmological constant being a constant of motion rather than a constant of nature. Um, in terms of kind of, in some sense, as heuristics for, for ways of trying to expand our theory space or, or, or the, the way we conceptualize our theory. Um, so thanks very much. If, if you want to know more, there's a whole selection of papers. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. Uh, Kareem, th thank you for that. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm very largely sympathetic to, to, mo to almost everything you say. Really? Are you I, sure? I, I'm, well, ex well <laughs> except that I assume that your reference to me and Everett was a sarcasm, so I'll put that aside. <laughs> but the, um, well, almost, I agree with almost everything you say. What I, what I found a little puzzling was that while the, your analysis of whether or not to treat something as a constant of motion in the cricket case, I think is appropriately thought of as the issue of whether or not one can view a certain system appropriately as being a subsystem of something larger. In general, I think the question about what to view as a constant of nature or not doesn't have that character. Certainly the example you used of the atomic, the atomic weight example doesn't have that character. It's, sure. ra uh, it, it's rather, in these other instances that I'm thinking of, it's rather that what one views as a constant, whether of nature or of motion or what have you, it is theory relative. If I'm modeling a fluid using Navier-Stokes, then shear then shear viscosity is a constant. If I'm modeling a you know a fluid using molecular kinetics, shear viscosity isn't a constant. That, that's a perfect example. Sorry, do you want to, Did you finish? Well, yeah, I just want I, just, just, just one or two more things, which is that, and so when, when you talk when you talked about. The, um, the need to have epistemic modesty about um, um, because we may not have access to all relevant scales. Again, I, I think that's exactly right, except I don't think that the, um, the emphasis on whether uh, on subsystems versus total systems really gets to the heart of the issue. To me, again, it's really um, uh, how finely grained one can investigate a system for any kind of quantity, spatiotemporal, energy, momentum, mass, what have what have you. And again, this is to me is a theory relative issue, not, not, not an issue about subsystem versus total system. So I, I'm just cu curious what you, what you think. Sure, no, I, 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 I think you're totally right. And I think there's a way of translating between the two. Like ultimately what we mean by a, by a subsystem is really just, like, is really to do with how, which particular time scale and spatial scale and energy scale we pick out. Right. On certain scales, there are no subsystems. There's just one great big system that couples. That's, that's, if you take the bit as big a possible length scale of um, the wavelength of the radiation and the time scale with which we're thinking about, we don't really have subsystems. But like, so essentially, what what I wanted to say is that we can use this subsystem system concept to pick out certain notions of constant nature, constant, certain questions about constant nature and constant motion. I think ultimately what it's then about is not about which subsystems we, or systems we have access to, but which energy and numerosity scales we have access to. And so I think the, the condensed matter analogy is exactly right, right? And I think the question is, if we're modeling a fluid or a BEC on a certain scale, certain constants give, get given a certain interpretation, right? So we might interpret the healing length in the um, gross pitievsky equation as a constant, as, a con as an essential constant in the context of modeling it on a certain scale. But then we would we'd decompose it into a different constants, um, some of which might be constants of motion, perhaps, um, on a, on a, on a more, more fine grained scale. So just as your example, that when we're, we're doing continuum mechanics of a fluid, um, we think about the constants differently to if we're doing the molecular dynamics. I think the problem for my view, right, would be that 
if there are situations in which we have competing theories on the same scales, which treat the constants differently, then it would it would seem that the way we think, the way we classify constants or interpret constants doesn't just depend upon the scale on which the theories we're using are well-defined, i.e. continuum versus molecular or um, um, long tem temporal scale versus short temporal scale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think in most, uh, to my understanding, in the cases we'll we almost always find that we don't have adequate theories that, are that work on exactly the same scales or the adequate exactly the same scales. Um, I'd be interested if you can think of theories where, where they're both kind of operable in the same spatio-temporal kind of numerosity scale, but have different interpretations of the constants. That would seem to, in some sense, justify even more perspectivity, maybe if more of the kind of Massimi trial of perspectivity. Um, but I, I'm not sure if, if, if we can think of examples like that. Does it, is, that is that helpful, Eric? It is, but I, um, but I, I think that there's still a little more subtlety, at least, that, um, that, than what you just said um, uh, illuminates. And the, the, it, it's actually related to the very last question you, um, you asked, which I think is exactly one of the right questions to think about, because there's, all, there's almost always more than one scale involved. In the, in yeah. So when you said, um, so, so uh, what, and that, and that's why I think that the subsystem total system um, and I'll, um, picture is too crude because yeah. if I'm looking at a, if I'm looking at a cosmological model, a space time model in GR, you know I can just do stand, standard FLRW or I'm treating it everything as a, um, as a fluid. But if I you know have a really if I, if I'm Euler and I also have a really you know and I also have a, have a fantastic supercomputer, then I can have a, a cosmological model of the universe where I model everything as using molecular kinetics. For the, for the matter. Now they're 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 both they're both universal models. They're both models of a whole yep. world. So there's no issue of one of it being a subsystem or not a subsystem. But in one, you know, sure, uh, the, the the viscosity is a constant. In the other, it's not a constant. Well, so, I I really like Daniele Iritti's um, Bronstein hypercube, mm -hmm. right? So I think what I would say is if we use the sorry just to explain the Bronstein cube is people usually draw a cube with um, Whatever it's Planck with Planck Planck's constant c and gravitational force, and the idea is quantum gravity is is the apex of the cube. Um, and what Ariti has pointed out is that really we need to add in the the number of degrees of freedom that we're fine graining over. Um, and so I think that's exactly right that we need to include that that notion of scale, the numerosity scale, which is actually something Anna Maria Kretsu has written about as well. Um, but I think my explanation is once we fix the theory, once we fix those things, at which may or may not be usefully connected to system subsystems, I completely agree. In some cases they will though, right? But once we fix those things, I would hope that science is such that we have a, we only have, we have a kind of empirically best or empiric, the theories that we have that are empirically adequate agree about what, what constants do what. And it's, I'm not saying it's impossible for, for us not to have that situation, but I think if we start having failure to, for us to have uh, agreement about constants, even given those that indexing to all those things, we're in trouble. And I would hope we don't get into that situation. But the fact that those things matter, that that should they should matter because because constants shouldn't have this kind of the distinction between constants in a situation where we don't know everything should never be given full metaphysical weight. So that, that I completely agree. And I'll conclude with, um, with, with this one last remark. You asked if anyone knew of uh, somewhere else in the literature where this is discussed. Uh, Wigner actually discusses it um, in the introduction to one of his essays in Symmetries and Reflections. I cannot remember which essay, but it's near, it's near the beginning of one of those essays. I'll have a look. Thanks, Eric. Th thank you. Joanna Lutz has uh, a question. Joanna. Okay. Uh, hey, how are you? Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm wondering, um, I was wondering whether it is really possible to change our view from seeing uh, constant um, as uh, lo mm, 
as accidental to think is as a lawful, despite the fact that Schlick gave us an example, but uh, it seems to me that it is a little bit different that than all other examples that you are considering. Uh, namely, in this Schlick example, if I understand his, it, it correctly, we first thought um, that these constants are just a kind of brute facts of nature. And this is one kind of accidental constant. And the mm -hmm. other kind would be that um, they can be derived from something, from some higher laws or deeper laws and some uh, factual truths. But uh, so the other kind of accidental cons constant are derivable constants. And um, uh, now, uh, once we make this distinction, I'm wondering whether uh, it is possible to first think that uh, a constant uh, is um, accidental in this uh, second sense, and then to change our view that in fact it is uh, nomic because if we can, if we can derive it from something, then it seems like more fundamental so I, view than just saying it is a law of nature that it is it has this value. I, I think this kind of points to Eric's ambiguity that I think there isn't an analogy between, thanks though, that is really, really good. That's exactly the right question, right? Like, and it's something I think I haven't made clear enough. So this, ultimately, you don't, you can't think of the situation, the two situations as the time reversed of each other, right? So it's not that we should think about um, imagining forget the, the inhabitants of cricket forgetting the universe was there and reclassifying constants going from um, accidental constant stroke constants of motion to constants of nature always being about having less information so that, or, or moving from a uh, to a smaller subsystem um, I think that wouldn't maybe even make sense but I think the idea would be that you would learn that your theoretical description is more is is coarse coarse grained when you thought originally it was fine grained. Um, so you you would be operating with, uh, let's say you thought fluids were continuum, and then you learn that, that they they have structure, and you learn that the constants you were using are products of the the coarse graining operation you've made. I think that would be the more general story. I think plausibly we could think about Planck's constant a bit like that, maybe. Um, something that didn't seem like a constant of nature when it, until we learned more about the, the, the structure of matter. Um, so I think it is a different, I think it's, it isn't, I think merely the Schlick quote on its own isn't enough to explicate the, the converse property. We can kind of think about it, the difference between promoting constants because everything it's always better to be a constant of nature than a constant of motion right and what i talked about mainly was the question of relegating cons constants taking something which we think of as a constant of nature and turning it into a constant of motion and i think there is a story about the converse of finding something that's that we thought was a constant of motion or accidental constant and turning it into a constant of nature I, I th my guess is that a general story could be something about um, basically understanding how our um, initial description, which involved the constant, um, was, was, was coarse graining it. But I'm not, not sure if that's helpful. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. My intuition was just that um, if we already have a derivation of a constant from something else, then um, <laughs> if someone else says that, in fact, it's a law, a law of nature, that this constant has this value, then we, um, we should either reject his claim or 
say that our derivation was wrong? What do you mean by derive? Most of these constants are all going to be fixed by experiment rather than uh, okay. derived. Uh, um, I fair. actually just thought another example is maybe the speed of light. Because mm -hmm. you could you could think about that as a as 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 it might you plausibly you could have thought before relativity the speed of light could have been different on different planets. Let's say um, there's no reason why it couldn't be something. There could be particular properties of the ether around Earth which meant it was was one speed and it could be different in different parts of the ether. I'm not saying this was the ether theory, but you could imagine the ether theory where the speed of light was different in different parts of the universe. And that moving the special relativity is turning it into from a constant of uh, accidental constant to a constant of nature. That's, maybe that's a nicer example. Okay, I see. So uh, the picture I had in mind uh, was that um, constant of motion can be calculated once we know laws and um, you know initial conditions, but <laughs> I somehow f forget forget about the fact that we never know initial conditions uh, well enough uh, to, in practice, uh, perform this calculation. So now I see that in that it's. I think it's a really that's a really good question about how you operationalize this more fully. Okay, thank you. No, thank you for the question. It was really interesting. Thanks. Um, other questions? Pedro has a question. Please, Pedro, go ahead. Uh, so, thank you, Karim, for your extremely interesting talk. Um, this is uh, going to be a very general question because uh, I'm Kind of familiar with uh, I've uh, followed with great interest your series of paper with Sean on your relational quantization approach to, to quantum gravity, and yeah, because you are building on the, this uh, at, uh, at the bottom this uh, shape dynamics perspective of classical gravity. So my my question is uh, fairly general. I mean. Because uh, in this uh, approach, as you know of very well, of course, what matters are scale invariant ratios. So, so ratios that uh, only ratios between magnitudes, scale invariant uh, quantities. In particular, for example, constants either of nature or of motion. So regardless of that distinction, I mean, the constants themselves should be scale invariant as well. So with dimensionless uh, quantities. So my, my question is, uh, because this is something that uh, uh, with colleagues are uh, trying to also put forward, I mean, how do you go about uh, defining at least a bit of such systems scales? Because you just said, for example, that you uh, succeed in in basically solving at the classical level singularity, uh, Big Bang singularity, and unlike, for example, the quantum cosmology, without introducing a Planck constant. Okay, so, but uh, in subsystem, there is a fact that basically uh, there are dimensionful uh, constants that are introduced to basically make contact with empirical data. And so in a relational, like yours, in a relational approach, there is no such thing as dimensionful uh, magnitude. So how is your take on the reproducing and uh, so, and on reproducing this, uh, this uh, scale variant behavior that we observe in, in labs on subsystems in general? Um, thanks. It's, it's a fascinating question, and I, I, I'm going to be very, very um, political and not properly answer it. Um, so, so look, I, I'm very, very sympathetic to to shape dynamics, to scale invariant approaches. I think it's really exciting. It's I think there are a lot of reasons to think it's plausible. However, the specific program that me and Sean have 
although it's kind of philosophically allied to shape dynamics and to that approach, doesn't actually require scale invariant models. So the, the mini superspace model that we're talking about, the, the reparameterization invariant model, they're not actually scale invariant. Um, so Barber's worked a lot about kind of combining having models that are both scale invariant and reparameterization invariant. Um, shape dynamics is both scale invariant and reparameterization invariant. There's a question about how you would treat the constraint that re is responsible for, re for um, the conformal invariance in the quantum theory, which I, which is, I think very interesting. It's, in some ways, it's an easier constraint. Um, it's also true that introducing, moving to the shape dynamics formalism makes the kind of procedure that Sean and I advocate easier in the sense that it involves um, kind of moving from this local reparameterization invariance, which, we, which is much more complicated to deal with, to the global reparameterization invariance. So in that sense, relational quantization, can, it, like it's a formal kind of um, help to have the scale invariance in GR. Um, so, so that's just more kind of like the, the, the general context. So I, so I don't personally, I haven't worked that much on scale invariant stuff. And I, so I wouldn't take myself to be speaking on behalf of the, of the advocates. I think the best I can do is try to kind of channel what Dave Sloan would probably say, or what, what Sean would probably say. And, and Enrique is here, so he can say what he would probably say himself. Um, so I think ultimately the, the point that, that Dave Sloan made to me, which I think is the most salient is actually to what extent do we get, is our information about the scale of the universe relational? When are we ever, like, when are we ever actually getting um, kind of fully um, um, dimensionful quantities out of our observation of the cosmos? If you think about the, the, the scale factor seems like the obvious example, but the scale factor is actually measured by looking at relative change in, in, in the separation of galaxies. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more to be said about how you can completely redo all of physics without scale. I think particularly, I think the two things they have problems with are the, the Higgs mass and there's one other constant, which I'm not sure they have a good account of how you can remove the, the dimensionfulness of, of those units. But I think from the perspective of um, operational cosmology, I'm not sure there's a necessity to have dimensionful units to, 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 as a framework for our, for our cosmology. We don't have a full theory of cosmology without dimensionful units because shape dynamics is, is only a classical gravity. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of plausibility to, the, to, to that idea, but I don't have, a, I have much of, of my own kind of original or constructive uh, contribution. So sorry, that was a slightly weak, weak answer, but it's a very good question. Okay, so, so, so then perhaps I, I, okay, that's, uh, I kind of misunderstood your, 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 your approach in, in because uh, it's so that you make refer reference sure. to shape dynamics to talk about your ontology in, in, as opposed to Einstein. Exactly, one. exactly. So, so I, I guess the, the way the connection would work would be as follows, right? For, for a theory which is locally time reparameterization invariant, the particular recipe that we have is not clear how, exactly how it would be applied because it involves finding a constant conjugate to a some form of, of parameterization variable, right? And so in a theory which is locally reparameterization invariant, like general relativity, where you have relativity or simultaneity, it's not quite clear what the constant would be that you can pick out because you don't in general have these constants in, 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 in the theory and you can't really connect them to time in such a clear way. Um, the idea is in shape dynamics, you can use the, 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 the way that shape dynamics allows you to decompose the, um, basically the symmetry into a global time reparameterization part and a conformal invariance part to imply this quantization recipe. Um, and we haven't shown how, how that would work even on a very basic model of GR. What I've talked about today was, or the model that we actually have is 
a very simplified cosmological model, which is so simple that it, that the, in some sense, you you enforce so much symmetry that the that general relativity only has a single global time parameterization kind of in the mix, which means we can apply our procedure. So if we want the problem of extending our procedure leads us straight into the problem of trying to apply it to shape dynamics. But that's not something we've actually done in practice yet. Does that make sense about how the, the bits fit together? Yeah, so because I got that you are dealing with global uh, yeah. time leveling symmetries, uh, which is basically inspired by shape dynamics. Yeah. But I kind of thought or took for granted that you also enforced vile conformations and you are basically sure. telling me that you don't. Not, not in, in the mini superspace model, we don't enforce, uh, okay. we don't do anything anything relating to conformal invariance or vile invariance. And like personally, like my hope, right? Like if you ask me honestly, is that we shouldn't have to choose, right? We should be able to understand either how to deal with full local reparameterization and variance in quantum gravity or with shape dynamics. I think I'm quite happy, I'm quite sanguine about the idea that we have um, undetermination problems about how we understand the symmetries of general relativity and that possibly um, general relativity in the ADM formulation and shape dynamics are more like dual theories. And I would hope to be able to understand time and quantization in both possibly in slightly different ways. And so ideally we'd be able to have a theory which was both conformally invariant and had local time reparameterization invariance. So I know some people think of the fact that shape dynamics gives you a way of, of, of foliating space time as a, as a feature, but personally I, I would quite like to not have to do that either. Um, but unfortunately it, it, the kind of, um, procedure that me and Sean have been working on, we haven't got a full story about how to apply it in general to a theory of local parameterizations at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. It was oh, thank uh, you. useful, thank you. Okay, so uh, before we start the second round of questions uh, with Eric, perhaps we will give the possibility to other people to ask a question. Is, is that okay, Eric, for you? Um, so, uh, Manili has a question. Please go ahead. So, thanks, Kareem, for your talk. Um, I want to make sure I understand the way that you're thinking about um, your unimodular approach to quantum cosmology. Mm -hmm. So, the way we usually think of energy non conservation for a subsystem. It's just that the subsystem degrees of freedom are an incomplete set of the total degrees of freedom. So mm -hmm. we expect that the subsystem's energy isn't going to be conserved by the dynamical equations. In the case of uh, your FLRW model, um, you, know, you point out that uh, lambda plays the role of energy, but, um, and, we can then think of say then yeah the universe as a subsystem and it's it's lambda is not somehow conserved or unique and so um, essentially you're thinking of the universe as a subsystem in the sense that it, it or at least the way we describe it in the flrw model is an incomplete description of whatever the total degrees of freedom are of the, I don't know, the universe as a whole. Is that the, the way you're thinking about? I think you're, thinking I think it? that's a really cool idea and it pushes me into this kind of even more, ex like this other realm, which I, the kind of other direction which I'd like to go, which is thinking about whether this, you could model this like an open quantum system. Um, right. But I think, but just, just to, kind of go back a little bit. I think the important thing is that lambda is still constant in any like meaningful sense. It's just we're we're in, we're in a superposition or each, I guess each um, part of the superposition is gonna be for a single value of, of lambda, right? So there's not gonna be, it's not that in the model that we have it, it's not that lambda is is changing or decaying in the sense of, of like a, 
open system leaking energy. I think it's actually re possibly a way of, of extending the model would be to incorporate that kind of features. Um, but we, ha we haven't done that yet. Um, so as it stands, the model um, is for superpositions of eigenstates of lambda, just like you would have, it's actually almost exactly the same as having a, a quantum systems and superpositions of energy. So it's not that there's there's failure of the conservation, it's just that the, the system is, um, the quantum state is not in, a, in an eigenstate, the overall kind of the overall quantum state. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and but so, there, so the there are yeah. I, there is actually yeah. a way of extending these models that I've looked at. Um, so so another kind of feature of the model that's relevant is that it involves incorporate it involves fixing a self adjoint extension, um, which does actually introduce a dimension into the, which going going back to Pedro's question, actually involves introducing a dimensional parameter so that we get the unitary evolution, which is responsible for the singularity avoidance. And what's quite interesting is if you went to remove that sulfur joint extension um, by integrating over them and removing the scale, you might, I, I'm pretty sure that you'll end up with a dissipative system, which is exactly what you're talking about. So I think that would then be the, the kind of model where you get kind of Neutral. lambda decaying or something like that. But I guess if, if you're gonna, if you go this route, thinking of it as an open quantum system, then um, I mean, I guess this is something like effective quantum cosmology as opposed to fundamental quantum cosmology. And in that point of view, we would still think of the wave function of the universe as a whole as being an eigenstate of uh, the super Hamiltonian operator or, or, or really just being one lambda, and this is a law, right? As or or, 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 or whatever whatever's beneath, right? Like I think the idea would be that there could be not the the issue isn't just that we've we haven't isolated all the degrees of freedom. We might not have isolated the right laws, right? Kind of like the continuum idea, so that we could imagine the quantized general relativity would be something like the gross Petievsky mm -hmm. equation, right? So a continuum, a quantum continuum hydrodynamics type model. Right. And there could be some more fundamental degrees of freedom. And once we understand those, we'd end up um, like thinking about things differently. But I guess my ultimate point is that like, if we have this effective field theory perspective where it's just effective field theories all the way up and all the way down, mm -hmm. we don't ex expect this process to ever bottom out. So, so is that the view you you want to pursue? Effective I don't know. Theory I, like, all the way down or up? I, I I think I think even about this methodological level, I think I like to remain fairly um, open minded. I think it depends what kind of heuristics you get out of that approach. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, like I said, one of the things I'd quite like to look at really carefully would be this idea of. Um, integrating out the dimension for parameter, which would make the theory closer to what Pedro was talking about, which then seems to have this interesting connection to dissipation. I think once we get to that, to try and understand how to interpret that model, I'd have to try and think about what, what's the best framework for that. Right. And if I may, just a quick technical uh, question. So you said in FLRW cosmology, Lambda plays the role of energy. Um, so when we do canonical quantization of uh, FLRW cosmology in a Hamiltonian picture, we get this, we can get this, uh, well, this like eigenvalue equation, and then we can think of superpositions of eigenstates yeah. of the cosmological constant. Um, isn't the same thing true at the level of the, uh, um, the general uh, Hamiltonian picture of Einstein gravity. I mean, so it doesn't Lambda, the cosmological constant uh, play the role of energy. You can think of the yeah. super Hamiltonian as H equals Lambda. And then if you do canonical quantization, direct constraint quantization, then you get a wave functional of the universe, which is an eigenstate of this Lambda. Yeah. And then you can do the same thing, take superpositions even at the general level. So it's not like a special feature of FLRW, but even a general feature. You're, you're totally right. But there's one qualification, which is, mm -hmm. is I probably should have made more 
point about is that that this isn't our approach this was done by by walden and unruh decades ago right. now um although they used quite different motivation and they didn't prove the singularity resolution um which we which i, I say we which sean did right um so that is our result but the, the model itself is identical to their model um however the the, the interesting question is in the context of unimodular gravity applied to full GR, um, where do you, how do you justify the preferred foliation that approach ends up requiring? And I think that's, and particularly right. Carol Kukosh wrote a quite critical paper about yeah. that point. Um, right. I think that's where the connection to shape dynamics also comes in. Right. Um, but I, you're totally right. You, this, in principle, this approach is applicable. This, this general unimodular viewpoint is applicable to full GR. Um, the question is just if you're applying it for a model that isn't already kind of in a nice foliated or in a kind of form such that there's only a single Hamiltonian constraint, um, how you justify in a sense gauge fixing all the other ones. Yeah, so so there it seems to me that's where, um, at least in the quantum context, you know, the way we understand quantum theory makes a huge difference. So for example, if we go Bohmian or De Broglie Bohm, uh, or we take a dynamical collapse approach, uh, we need to have a preferred foliation anyway to make, to, to define the dynamics, either for the, whatever the beable is or the, mm. uh, the local beables or the wave function. And so this is one way of doing it. Um, I, 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 is, I, I, is there I, any is special what... reason for that in particular? Well, you know, who knows, but. Yeah, I agree, and this is just one of these things that, unfortunately, my my work seems, keeps on leading me into things like multiverses, preferred foliations, well, none of which I like. But that I don't know. Uh, that's that's more of a, a, a general statement. I think personally, I'd quite like to work with one universe and no fixed foliation and conformal invariance and time. And someone can give me a theory where can I, I can have all of those. I'm going to be really happy, but. I don't quite see how to do it at the moment. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so back to Eric. So th this is something that um, I, I think that was a, came up, ten, well, almost came up, or it was suggested by your discussion with Joanna. I, I just wanna see, see what you think about it. So there's there's a further subtlety um, in, in the conceptual issues, of, like there always is. This is philosophy. There's it's when you talk about a constant of nature um, as treated, say, in different theories. So say the speed of light. You know, um, the speed of light we think is a constant in classical Maxwell theory. It's a it's a constant in Einstein Maxwell theory. It's a constant in QED. But what those claims mean. That, that claim means something different in each case because velocity means something different in each case. Mm. And it's also, the, it's also the case that what it means to be for a quantity to have a constant value means something in each case. What it means for a, con, a constant to have a constant value in QED is different than what it means for a constant, constant to have a, a, a quantity to have a constant value in classical Maxwell theory. And this I think is especially relevant to, to the issue of how to think of the cosmological constant because it depends on whether you mean the cosmological constant in classical GR or the cosmological constant in semi-classical gravity or the cosmological constant in canonical quantum gravity. And I, I'm just wondering if you think that these, that these kinds of subtle conceptual issues actually really are when, you know, when, when the physics rubber hits the road and you start, and you start coming up with, with you and Sean are coming up with your cosmological models, does that, does that really, do the conceptual issues just fall away, or do you think that they actually have a bearing on how we're supposed to think about what the physics of these models are? I, I think they they have a huge bearing, to be honest. And I, I like I think yeah, like you're gonna not be too surprised. For me, the really, really helpful thing on ultimately for thinking about these models was the condensed matter analogy. Um and so Perhaps not in interpreting the constant, the the cosmological constant, but this effective field theory style view on quantized GR comes directly from uh, analog model 
that has the same physical structure as our cosmological model, in at least some 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 cases. And that's uh, something called the Efimov state. I don't know if I've talked to you about this before. Um, so if you have three bound bosons, um, they can be effectively modeled by one over R squared potential. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is, is basically use that effective model, because that, that's not the real potential, right? So you can get the Schrodinger equation with one over R squared potential and use it to describe this, this, this atomic system. Um, and what you find is that um, you need to get this to work. You need to introduce a constant, which is a self-adjoint extension parameter, which is dimensionful. And that's used in, that's to get the experimental um, kind of, um, or to get the, it has to take some value for it to get the maths to work for it to be self-adjoint. And that value is, needs to be experimental in, in the experiments they've done, they experimentally determine. And the way that they do this is actually by shining a, a laser onto the system. And the, the parameter ends up being a phase that the system picks up. Um, and so you can basically think about this dimensional full parameter that comes into the description of the system in the condensed matter context as encoding or what the information that you've coarse grained out by treating something that isn't a one over R squared potential as a one over R squared potential. That if if there isn't a fundamental constant, it's something which if you coarse grained, you'd you'd find it find, sorry, fine grained, you'd find more structure in it. Um, and so in that context, that thinking about that matter situation with the very similar mathematics helped us think about what the self-adjoint extension parameter is doing in the context of the cosmological model. But to answer your question more properly, right? I don't have a good way of thinking about the cosmological constant as a constant of motion. Maybe thinking about a condensed matter analogy will help me do that. And I think that's certainly if you think about how Maxwell's physical reasoning worked, he was endlessly switching back and forth between little toy models of one thing, mechanical models of another thing. Um, and I think that's probably where these more conceptual um, kind of playful ideas of like, how should we think about constants? It, more than in a mathematical sense, in a kind of philosophy of physics sense really feeds in. It kind of gives you a different line, lines of, an, of, of analogical reasoning so you can reconceptualize things. Um, is, that, is that the kind of question you're asking or have I just rambled uh, a bit? No, that, that helps, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a question actually. Um, and uh, it concerns uh, the perspectival uh, side of the matter, because I would like to um, understand better what is the kind of uh, perspectivism uh, you have in mind uh, when you talk about the distinction between uh, uh, constant of motion and constants of nature. Because, uh, I mean, I don't have uh, uh, many problems uh, with uh, perspectivism as uh, an epistemic thesis, okay? So it depends on what we know about uh, the state of affairs, uh, uh, the, the, the fact of the, the conclusions that we draw. But then you mentioned uh, the, the work uh, by Evans and uh, I happened to read his uh, 2020 paper on the European journal. <clears throat> And it seems to me that uh, Evans has uh, a more radical idea of perspectivism. He seems to be a neo-Borean kind of philosopher where basically we don't have to ask about um, a <clears throat> objective fact regarding something. There is, uh, uh, let's say an observer indexed notion of uh, objectivity regarding facts uh, uh, on, on about about something so this seems to me a metaphysical thesis and a quite uh, uh, radical one and from this point of view your uh, freudian sleep when you said uh, copenhagen instead of copernican just rang a bell so I just would like to press you a little bit more on that. I mean, do you think that there is no 
uniquely objective fact of the matter regarding the distinction between constants of nature and constants of motion? Thanks, Antonio. That's a wonderful question. Um, so, I don't know. Like, this is, it's difficult to, to, to... I think I want to kind of define things. It's easy for me to say what I don't think, right? So I think there's a danger in perspectivism to make this, for it to lapse into this claim of, of um, like, in a sense, like, epistemic relativity, right? To say, well, look, um, the distinction between constants of motion or constants of, of nature is merely a distinction between, uh, it's merely a product of, 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 of my, my viewpoint as a, um, as a human living in 21st century Britain um, during the COVID pandemic or whatever, right? And I, I, certainly nothing like that is what I want to say, right? I think I would take it to be, in a sense, this is where I think you can kind of draw two different types of, of, of Copenhagen, more along the kind of neo-Kantian flavor, right? Where you're saying, well, look, maybe it's a necessary precondition of our kind of being agents at a scale who try to organize themselves in a certain way. Um, given what we know, there's no choice in what, how we'd classify constants, right? There's, there's, there's that like, it just, it isn't the case that, that um, you could just imagine a counterfactual scenario where culture or norms were different and we con classify constants differently, right? So I think that sense of like absolute failure of objectivity is something I want to go quite far away from. On the other hand, I think the issue with saying um, it's purely epistemic, but metaphysically at an epistemic level, we should, we should always open to revise this distinction but there is some fact of the matter ultimately out there. My worry is just that I'm just generally not confident that there is a way of completing physics, even in principle, that why we have to assume there is a final theory. If we have this tower of, if it's an analogy, right? Because we, we don't think that effective, unless I was going to say something mean, unless we're James Fraser, we don't think effective field theories are going to last forever. James doesn't really think that, but you people have argued, and I think Porter Williams argues this as well, I think, I don't know this literature that well, that in some sense, we should just think about um, these stories of, of more and more effective field theories, and we, we'll, we'll just kind of explore the, the, the theory scape. Um, I think that's actually not skeptical enough. I think we've got, perhaps the whole framework of renormalization theory will break down. There's reasons to think why that might happen. We should be can be skeptical even that we're, uh, what we'll find won't be just another effective field theory. It'll actually just be another type of theory altogether. Um, so I think it's not that I actually think that we'll just be doing effective field theory in, in its current guise for the rest of time. But as an analogy, I quite like this idea that we kind of keep on looking, we find more structure, both when we look at um, different energy scales, but also when we look at different fine grainedness on numerosity scales. Um, like, it's not like we're gonna run out of degrees of freedom to include, right? We're so far from, from, from including all degrees of freedom that it's ridiculous, right? And so the, the claim is just that if, we never think there'll be a situation in which science will reach a settled kind of a perspective in which we can include all, all, all scales. Um, what, what, how should we cash out these metaphysical claims, right? Or what, what's, what purchase do they have if we're like, um, so I think I can understand a metaphysical perspective when we think about science as approximating the truth, right? And we think about science is getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And we're kind of, um, we can imagine this like asthmatotic science and we can talk about it, right? So that's not a viewpoint I have. So I'm not a, a kind of realist in that sense, 
right? So I think almost everything that we think could be radically revised through incorporation of, um, of new theories that save the phenomena, right? And I think in that situation, I'm not sure what it means to talk about final theories or at least asymptotic theories. Um, possibly like similarly, um, someone like Richard David, who's, who's not particularly realist, He's a realist in a context where string theory is, 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 is final, the final theory or something like that, right? So if you have this view that, that we know what the final theory might look like, either because it's some kind of cleaned up effective field theory or it's um, string theory, um, or science approximates the truth, so it will be approximately like our current theories, then I think saying something like answering your question properly rather than giving this waffly equivocating answer that I'm giving would make sense, right? And I would, in that context, if I believed any of those things, I would say, yes, there is a fact of matter. It is the classification that the, between constant motion, constant nature, that the final theory would give. And that by the final theory, I mean this. But because I don't have that kind of resource for talking about what I mean by the final theory, I'm just really reluctant to, to say that. I, I, hope for that. I hope for that wasn't too equivocal and uh, size difficult answer. No, no, this is, this is very helpful. I, I didn't know that you had these, uh, these ideas, these, you were not, uh, let's say, a fully realist. So I, I got to know you. I think, like, I think my, my main thing is I just, I think we should be humble about how weird, like, let's think about the last 150 years, right? Like, if the next 150 years of science a 1% as weird as the last 150 years, then we're gonna get a very different picture of the world in 150 years, right? And so I think um, there's so much we don't know that it's very difficult to know, like, like, in a sense, like kind of going back to Eric's point, maybe the entire framework of constants of nature and constants of motion and the way we distinguish between them won't be adequate anymore, right? Like some of the other kind of, angle on this question that people have talked about is having varying constants of nature, which obviously makes them a bit um, self-contradictory, right? So there's some there's older ideas from, from Poincare about the speed of light uh, varying. There's also, to some extent, empirical evidence that lambda varies, although it's disputed in the literature how, how strong that is. Um, I think that kind of phenomena where the constants have a new property in a sense. They're constants of nature, which are spatiotemporally varying. Like, I'm not ruling out that even this framework of, of having these different types of constants and distinguishing them. And for instance, who says that constants of nature are the ones which we can't take superpositions of in quantum theory and constant motion is the one that we can, right? That relies on what we've done so far in, in quantum theory. So I think I'm just, why well, I'm very reluctant to say that there's a, um, a matter of fact isn't just a pro I guess it's not just a product of the perspectivism in the specific sense I talked about. It's more of a product of a kind of general pessimistic meta-induction type, type feeling. Um, 